Good evening. Very much welcome to this uh, seminar late in the day. Uh, we have a fantastic panel. We have a subject that is extremely challenging, disinformation and strategic communication in our time. When I started in multilateral affairs, strategic communication used to mean that you reached out with your strategy and what you wanted to do to build support and be constructive. Today, that term connotes something very more complicated. Our world is complicated. There are sinister forces that are more difficult to deal with, twists and turns, in the everyday requires us to reflect more deeply. And so for us at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, we surely have to make this the core of our business. And so it cuts through our programs. This program today is headed by Björn Fegersten, our Europe uh, program, but you can imagine that this impacts also our Russia program, our global program, because it cuts to global cooperation, what norms-based multilateralism is. And so we are reaching out to partners, and we're very happy to work with the Swedish Civil Constingu uh, cons Sorry, <laughs> Contingencies <United> Agency <laughs> and the Atlantic Council. Well, you, before we get through with all our collaboration, this is going to stick to the tongue. But uh, uh, we are happy to work with you in a collaboration that already started in Washington, D.C., that will continue through seminars and work throughout all our programs. Um, with that, I actually want to welcome not just the participants, but the people who have come uh, from afar to participate. And I give the word to Björn Fegersten, head of the Europe and Transatlantic Program at the Institute. Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mats. Lots of pro focus of my program this uh, semester has been on uh, Catalonia, Brexit, and transatlantic relations. And these issues are complicated in their own right, uh, but they have all turned even more dramatic and actually more divisive uh, thanks to misinformation, disinformation, and cyber attacks. Russian involvement in the Brexit campaign, as well as in the uh, situation with Spain and Catalonia, has been made increasingly clear the last weeks. So disinformation and weaponization of information by adversarial actors is no longer a specific kind of threat domain. It is a dimension of almost any political conflict or major event, even any two uh, process that is happening right now. So how does this affect our democracies and how can state and non-state actors respond? That is the topic of tonight and we have an excellent and very competent panel here tonight to help us address these issues. We have Ambassador Daniel Fried, your distinguished fellow with the Atlantic Council, Alina Polyakova, David M. Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution, Alexandre Alaphilippe, your co-founder and director of operations at the Saper Vedere, and Nils Schweiz, the director general of MSB, the Swedish Civil Contingent Agency. And Daniel, I would like to start with you. If you want to sit down for it, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, all of you, you do as you please. This year, you retired as uh, one of America's longest-serving diplomats, uh, having served presidents from Jimmy Carter to Donald Trump. And you played a key role in, in designing and implementing American strategy uh, towards Europe um, for almost four decades. And a common theme in much of, kind of disinformation campaigns that we see right now is to, to weaken and divide what we call the West uh, as a political actor and as a force. So how big of a problem is this and how should we respond uh, together? Please. Um, thank you and f thanks to our Swedish partners who have made this possible. Um, a lot has been said and is being said about the impact of Russian disinformation. And I could spend the entire time talking about that. But what we are trying to do, the we being the Atlantic Council, um, in cooperation, especially with Alina, late of the Atlantic Council, is to unpack the problem and discuss what we can do about it. 
So that's, that's where I would like, I'll simply posit that Russian disinformation can be damaging in certain circumstances and we risk long-term deterioration of our, civil dis our civic discourse if we let Russian disinformation go unchecked. Um, what the Atlanta Council is trying to do in cooperation with our Swedish partners is to come up with recommendations about what governments and non-government organizations, both civil society and the private sector, should actually do. And I'll sketch out some of our thinking um, to try to give a framework for what we're thinking of by way of action. First of all, we have to remember who we are and stay true to our values. This is a Cold War lesson. When the United States forgot its democratic principles and supported right-wing regimes who were reliably anti-communist, we made serious mistakes. We have to remember who we are. We cannot become them as we fight them. We, uh, we won, the West won the Cold War by ultimately remembering who we were and remembering the power of democracy. Now that sounds, you know, pitiful stuff, it, it, it really, but we have to mean it. We have to take this seriously. And a second principle is that the United States cannot act effectively if it acts unilaterally. My last job in government was to design the sanctions against Russia after its invasion of Ukraine. And we did something we never did before. We negotiated them, we discussed them with Europe first before we made our decisions. And that was the right decision and it was a happy, it was a good experience. Um, we need to work with Europe. The United States and Europe need to design common strategies and common approaches for two reasons. One, they're apt to be more effective and more specifically, our leverage is much greater if we are acting together. I would rather do less with Europe than more unilaterally. Um, but I want to now try to unpack the problem of Russian disinformation. The way we see it, it exists on three levels. One is the level of overt propaganda, RT, Sputnik. That's regular propaganda. It's awful, but it is also identified. A second level, and much more tricky to get at, is social media. Trolls, bots, cyborgs, which are human bot combinations, have exploded on social media and are extending the work of Russian overt propaganda. Americans are coming to this problem as we usually do, late and with a lot of energy. Uh, Europe has been there. Europe, Sweden, um, the Baltic countries, others have, have been here, have understood the problem for longer than we have. But the social media problem is one which we are just trying to get our arms around. Third level is downright illegal Russian behavior, cyber hacking, which is a problem much broader than disinformation. It is a problem of potential sabotage. But it, cyber hacking, as, the, as we Americans discovered to our dismay last year, can be combined with propaganda and with social media infiltration to extend the reach of Russian disinformation. We have to act on three levels. We need also to combine government and legislative action, consulting closely with Europe. We have to work with social media companies to make sure that they behave responsibly, and they have not done so. So far, they have been called out for their blindness and deserve to be, but we need to work with them and help them reform themselves. And we also have to work uh, to use tools to go after cyber hacking, which may involve sanctions against maybe the troll farms in Russia and the cyber, the malign cyber actors. We need, from an American perspective, we need to work with Europe. In, the, in 30 seconds to wind up, I will say something because somebody ought to say it and you're all thinking it, something about the Trump administration. Okay, so at the, yeah, at the top there is a big question mark. Okay, I get it and I don't have an answer. 
at the level on which I operated, this sort of undersecretary of state level, the assistant secretary level, the Europe team in the Trump administration is pretty good. It's solid. And there is an understanding at that level and probably unevenly at higher levels that this is a serious problem. My colleagues in government, frankly, want, my sense is want to do the right thing. They need some help. That is what the Atlantic Council is trying to do. And we are trying to do this with Europe so that we come up with combined transatlantic recommendations to our respective governments so we stop admiring the problem of disinformation and start combating it. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for taking up the... The issue with Trump, I, I would have done it otherwise. But it's, but it's more complicated, and I, I just want to ask you, I mean, the, how do we craft cooperation when we at the same time have, have these differences in our societies, uh, and especially differences on, on what is supposed to define our response, our resilience, that is the rule of law, strong respected media, liberal values. And, and to, be, to be honest, it's not only Trump, we see it in several European societies. I know you've been ambassador to Poland, for example, I'm sure you follow news from there. Uh, so this is not only a Trump problem, the kind of core liberal values are under attack also from within, uh, not outside of the West. So how, how do we manage to, to forge a strong cooperation in this kind of illiberal times? Well, I've got two levels of answers. One, no matter what we do to block, impede, or resist Russian disinformation, everything we do will be imperfect, Okay the crooked timber of humanity and all that. We will, some disinformation will get through. Ultimately, the strongest weapon is the resilience of democratic societies. And that idea came principally from Alina Polyakova. Okay, I've just appropriated it and I need to give her credit. That's been her major emphasis. Policy solutions will be incomplete. Now, your larger question is, how do we rally the forces of liberalism, the forces of the free world against the nationalist wave? That's well beyond what we're doing, but I recognize that that is the principal, um, that is the deeper challenge. Yeah. And quite separately, we're working um, with like-minded people on both sides of the Atlantic to try to grapple with this problem. The nationalists, have their slogans and they have momentum. We need to recover ourselves and remember who we are. Um, Putin is feeding on that. I mean, we can talk about that um, at the kind of ideological level, but he is feeding on cynicism and the sag in democratic self-confidence. We will get past that, but we won't get past it without effort. And we won't get past it um, unless we take seriously both the intellectual challenge, the political challenge, and the disinformation challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, Alina, you have a very long experience as a researcher and an analyst of, of Russia, Russian foreign policy, transatlantic relations, and also European politics and European far-right uh, parties. Uh, and now you're at Brookings, but before that at the Atlantic Council, so you're only in Washington. Would you like to give us a perspective from Washington and, and what's the discussion right now in the situation? Uh, thank you, Bjorn, and uh, thank you to our uh, Swedish partners from the MSB as well for making all this possible. Um, well, I feel like Ambassador Fried set me up to talk about resilience. Uh, we can, I think, talk about that uh, maybe in the question and answer. It's, it's a pretty big issue uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but what I thought I would do, since we're coming from Washington, is talk a bit about the political climate there in a way that you perhaps don't see in the media headlines here uh, in Europe um, uh, or elsewhere for that matter because our president's tweets seem to overwhelm uh, the headlines these days and there's more happening uh, beyond the tweets. Uh, so I think first of all, uh, we've seen a, a real change in bipartisan politics when it comes to the broader Russia question. Uh, unlike uh, even a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, Today, Russia and the position on Russia is actually perhaps the only bipartisan issue in the U.S. Congress. Um, we see evidence of that. Is that working? Should I sit closer? Okay. 
Uh, is that better? Okay. Uh, there's evidence of this bipartisanship uh, in the only legislation that the president has so far actually signed since he's taken office, and that's been uh, the sanctions legislation, primarily focusing on Russia, but also including North Korea and Iran. Uh, the I won't talk in detail about the technical side of the sanctions. Ambassador Friedman can do that better than I can. Uh, but I think it signals very clearly that both Democrats and Republicans are united unanimously that there needs to be consequences that the Russian government has to pay for what it's done to interfere in the U.S. presidential elections. The motivations may be different. Uh, I think the Democrats are still out for revenge, um, and the Republicans have generally been more uh, hawkish on this issue. But today, this is really, uh, I would say, a centrist foreign policy view that we need to deter, that we need to reinvest in Europe's east, that we need to actually reinvest in NATO. Um, and I think at the congressional level, this is very, very clear. Uh, one interesting uh, provision that the sanctions law entails is a $250 million fund uh, to partially counter Russian influence operations, uh, cyber hacking, other forms of above-the-line and below-the-line activities in Europe. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with that, but uh, yet uh, it's been authorized but not appropriated, as we often say in the United States. Um, but it's a clear signal that there will be more investment from the U.S. government in taking this issue seriously. So that's one point. Um, the other point is that uh, what Ambassador Fries started to say about the social media companies. Uh, this has really been a watershed moment um, in, in the U.S., but I think globally. Um, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, as some of you may know, testified in the U.S. Congress uh, at the end of October, beginning of November. Uh, and I think what they revealed was shocking. It was also interesting to me that they didn't send their policy experts or their CEOs to testify. They sent their attorneys and lawyers to testify. Um, so it shows that they're clearly uh, under pressure. Uh, they're under fire uh, from U.S. potential U.S. regulation. And um, just a few figures for you in case you didn't catch those congressional testimonies that I thought were quite shocking. Uh, Facebook testified, for example, uh, that 150 million uh, accounts, users on Facebook, uh, saw Russian-produced content from the troll farm, uh, the so-called IRA Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. 150 million in just two months. Uh, Twitter testified that the accounts linked to this um, IRA troll farm uh, produced 80,000 tweets, and they identified about 3,000 accounts, which I think is a gross, gross understatement. Um, I think some of us who follow Russia have, just on our own Twitter feeds, 3,000 bots and trolls following us. So I find it quite shocking that Twitter um, continues to not be honest and not disclose some of this information. And the last figure that I thought was very interesting is how cheap all of this was. Uh, so to reach 150 million people on Facebook and Instagram, uh, the Russian troll farm spent less than $100,000. Uh, it's, it's really nothing considering how much uh, is spent on campaigns in the United States and also in other European countries and how much of a broad effect it seemed to have, perhaps in not changing people's actual votes, uh, but certainly at influencing the broader public debate. There's no doubt about that. So I think the moment of freewheeling for Google, Facebook, and Twitter is coming to an end. Uh, it's, all, it's already come to a bit of a, a deciding point in Europe, uh, and that's not something we managed to do in the United States. So in Europe, uh, these companies agreed to a voluntary code of conduct around hate speech, for example. Um, and this could be expanded is something we talk about in our paper, the Ambassador Fried mentioned, uh, this, this voluntary code of conduct could be expanded to propaganda and disinformation, uh, but hasn't been yet, but at least there's a regulatory basis for that here in Europe. And lastly, on a bit of a darker note, uh, you know, I think this is just the beginning of a much, much bigger problem. Um, with advances in technology, particularly uh, artificial intelligence, machine-driven learning, we are, I think, at a turning point uh, in this online space that we've considered very open and very free and that's been allowed to develop in this very organic way. But now what we're seeing is these technologies that have connected us 
globally, all these social media platforms, Google, um, can also be easily manipulated by malicious actors. And now that the, the Russians have put this template out there, this template of political warfare, and have shown there's been very few consequences for it, frankly, despite the sanctions legislation, um, and that it's been very cheap. This can be easily replicated and is already being replicated by non-state actors, terrorist groups, state actors, anybody that really has uh, no less than 100,000 to throw in at, at, at this. So what kind of role are we going to see in the next three to five years? I think unless we do something now, it's going to be a world where we actually can't distinguish between automated accounts and human accounts. This is where artificial intelligence is heading. Uh, Social media platforms themselves may not be able to distinguish between automation and human, real human interaction. Uh, there's new technology uh, being produced primarily for, by researchers at Stanford that can replicate uh, somebody's voice. You can do this if you go online. It's called uh, Lyrebird, um, and you can record your voice for one minute, and then it will spit out your voice speaking to you. It sounds like you. Um, other technologies can replicate video just from inputting uh, existing videos that can make somebody say something they didn't say and looks authentic. Uh, these are all things that are happening now, and they have really uh, broad and potentially negative implications going forward. Uh, so I think one thing that we also try to do in our paper is try to think through what are these emerging threats and how do we turn it back a notch so we don't find ourselves in this nightmare scenario in the very near term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you talked about the, the negative consequences, and of course disinformation campaigns can serve for different purposes, making us believe in specific things, take specific decisions, but also make us stop believing. Um, I mean, to erode the support for institutions, the media, and kind of key societal functions. As a, as a Russia analyst also, what would you say is the key, is there one goal, overarching strategy behind, behind this wide area of disinformation? Or is it only taking opportunities where they show up? So on the one hand, there's been a lot of hysteria, I think, around Russia in the United States. And I, I want to be careful uh, not to see Russia everywhere. Um, there's this Italian saying that, um, you know, you could say Russia's like parsley. It's everywhere now, right? Um, it's not like, well, it's, in reality, it's not everywhere. Um, I think we overestimate the level of coordination the Russian government has in, in launching these kinds of disinformation campaigns. I think what's been obvious is there are many, many proxies entering, uh, acting at the direct or indirect uh, behest of the Russian government. Some are, you know, in some ways when Putin says these are volunteers, he's not exactly wrong. Um, there are plenty of criminal organizations that are trying to curry favor with the government. Uh, you know, they have their own political or economic uh, agenda. And they carry, carry out some of these attacks as well. Um, so I think we want to be careful about that um, on the first hand. But I think in, in the broader scheme of things, um, you asked about the end goals. Um, there are multiple end goals. Uh, but I think one has clearly been, if you look at the ads that Facebook released to Congress, uh, that they clearly identify as Russian-produced ads, there's no ideology there. Um, there's no consistency in views. Uh, one ad supports uh, far-right groups. Another ad supports liberal leftist groups. Uh, one ad is an anti-Muslim ad. Another ad looks like a pro-Muslim ad. I think the point is that the tools they use, these micro-targeting tools, Facebook gave to them because they were advertisers, they were clients, right? Um, and these tools were ready to go. So they could micro-target and say, an individual who has a very specific political view, who lives in a swing district, not just a swing state, but a swing district in the United States, and they could target these ads to people they knew would be receptive. I think these kinds of technologies um, can really serve the most negative uh, intentions, the most malicious intentions. Um, but I think on the Russian side, I don't think they expected the outcome they got. Nobody actually expected our elections to go the way they did. And I think now they don't really know what to do with it still, in some ways. They don't know how to interpret what's happening in the United States um, and what the president says and then actually what happens in terms of policy. So I think it's a very cynical uh, worldview that the Russians have, and they try to export that cynicism to our societies. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's shift focus to, to the other side, or our side of the Atlantic. I mean, this has been a very intense uh, political year in Europe with elections uh, in, in, well, in Britain, in France, and in Germany. And Alessandro, you're a former political advisor in France, and you're now a social media expert based in Brussels. You're co-founder and director of operation at um, Saper Vadir, and I know you follow the French elections very closely, so please, could you tell us something about what you found? Good night, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry for my voice. I'm not going to sing tonight. Fortunately for you and fortunately for me. Um, also, a disclaimer, I'm, I'm someone who six months ago didn't know anything about Russian influence at all. We just a regular social media company and we had a look at some things and we learned a lot. And that's um, how we got into this. So. I'm going to this. OK, so basically, I have a, I have a problem. I don't see people as people. I see people as nodes, and you'll see you'll enter into my mind, and that's going to be very easy for you at some point. But basically, I am a node, you're a node, we all are nodes in this room, and we all have interactions. We have links. These interactions means we talk to each other. And what is fantastic with interactions is we can mathematically count them. I can talk once, I can talk three times, I can talk three times, four times, and we can see how many interactions we have. And what is good with interactions also is that we can give direction to inter these interactions. So I'm speaking to you once, twice, three times, four times. And on social media, what is very interesting is the people who receive the more information. Why? Because they mean they are followed, they are retweeted, they are mentioned, they are replied to. So the more interaction you receive, the more noise you create on the social media. So that are the people we are interested in. And what we do, we give different nodes, with different size to the nodes. The bigger you are, the influential, the most influential you are. So you're going to tell me, okay, you, Alexandre, it's very nice. You have two nodes now. It's very nice. Thank you so much. Good night. No, because I, I've been a, a real fan of uh, impressionist since I was a little boy. So I like to add colors to my, to my paintings. So we also use um, an algorithm, which is a cluster algorithm from the Louvain-la-Neuve University. And what does this algorithm do? Basically, he brings nodes that have a lot of interactions together, and he gives them the same color. Why? Because when you, you have many interactions together, it means you are interested by the same thing. You interact with the same, on the same issue, or you follow the same people. And what we do, we bring these people together, we give them colors, and then we spread them, and we analyze what they say, what different communities say. And that's what we do. We can give different colors to our nodes. So now you're going to look at social media in a whole different way. You're going to walk home and say, honey, you're not, a, you're not my wife, but you're a node, and we have a lot of interactions together. But if you look at the French presidential elections, social media looks like this. So this is Twitter. This is 11 million tweets for one month. And you see here you have the different communities, political communities that were interested by the French presidential elections. So basically here you have a socialist community. Here you have a more far-left community. Here you have liberal communities with François Fillon and Emmanuel Macron who share a lot of things. And here we found out that we have all our far-right communities in France. And when we look at the far-right communities in France, we of course find Marine Le Pen and people from her family, like Marion Maréchal Le Pen or uh, Louis Alliot, her husband. But we also find here Russia Today and Sputnik. And for us, that was very interesting because that meant that they had a lot of interactions together. The communities behind that are acting and retweeting Front National campaign were also very active in retweeting Russia Today and Sputnik. So what we did, we collected all the data around Sputnik and Russia Today for three months and we tried to understand who were the people actively retweeting this propaganda. And what was very interesting, we found out that we had basically three communities. One is very in, in, in yellow here, which is quite big, but quite um, non-influential in the ballot. This is 0.5% in the ballot. This is conspiracy theorist François Asselineau. Here you have a community supporting uh, François Fillon, which was a conservative candidate. And here you had the uh, Front National community. And we did the same thing. So we took this apart and said, OK, now let's look at all the fake news and the rumors during the French elections. And we did the same work. We collected all the people that spread fake news and rumors during the French elections. 
We do the same, we extract their audience and we try to understand this. And we see that we have here again a community supporting Marine Le Pen, here one François Fillon, and another one who felt very sorry about Mr. Sarkozy um, that he couldn't um, go into the ballot for this time. But what was interesting, if you overlap the two databases, that means that you have the more rumors you spread during the campaign, the more chances you had to be in the Kremlin network, which means that basically you have um, a, a social media behavior about people who don't care about where the narrative comes from. It could be Russia, it could be anything else. But the thing is, as long as they serve their political interest, they use it online. They weaponize information to be ready to spread it to their community and to use this as um, a political tool. Did you hear about the Macron leaks? Does that sound familiar to you? Maybe not? Okay. Basically, on the last day of the campaign, you had these huge fake leaks uh, about Emmanuel Macron claiming that he had an offshore account in, uh, in Bahamas and uh, 15 gigabytes of uh, emails with a lot of things, Emmanuel Macron ordering cocaine, etc., etc., etc. And it was four hours before the end of the campaign. So basically, it was a warfare operation to be sure that something is being spread just before the vote to instigate the doubt about Emmanuel Macron. But fortunately, we did this analysis before and we were able to map and to source live the different accounts that were spreading this during the campaign and that were active three hours before the end of the campaign. So basically, that was our researcher posting different maps and tracking the, the news, the fake news back to the US and to Jack Posobiec, which is uh, now a very renowned um, far-right spokesperson in the, in the United States. And, and the, role, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the role of WikiLeaks were very quick to spread this narrative and then the role of the far-right French communities really jumping into the narrative. And for the first time, we had a very clear merge between, between far-right communities in France, in the US, WikiLeaks activists, etc., trying to only spread their narratives about Emmanuel Macron is lying about something and you should know this because you're going to vote tomorrow. So what we did is basically to expose this live. So in 90 minutes, we were able to produce the first maps and we give them to journalists to be able for them to fight this and to say, okay, something is going on. You need to know that something is going on. We're going to have a look at the 15 gigabytes of data, but that's not, that's not going to take uh, two hours. We need to go deep to understand if it's true or fake. And basically, that is the result when you're fighting fake news live. Basically, this is, this is 10.30 after WikiLeaks and Jack Posobiec. So you have here an English-speaking community here in the US, here around WikiLeaks, and here in pink, you have far-right, French far-right activists. And when you look at midnight, so 90 minutes later, the French and English far-right communities merged into one community for the first time because they had strong interactions together. And that was the first time in the campaign. Usually we, we saw Trump activists, but they were like really isolated because French people don't speak English, Trump activists don't speak English, French, I don't know. <laughs> but they were very isolated during the whole operation we saw. And at some point, we see that they merge into one community because they have strong interaction for the first time. And here, you have people trying to resist. You have here a resilience bubble. Here are, is our researcher. He now has a lot of followers and a lot of journalists following him. So he's, he was able to spread the word saying, okay, this is, this is going on. We can say that people that are spreading Macron leaks they are the one who spread Pizzagate, the other one who spread fake news of the past four months. So do whatever you do, but don't trust them. After this, um, we had uh, some look at the UK elections. And what was very interesting, we mapped also the, the Kremlin network in the UK. We didn't have the time to go further into the analysis, but what was very interesting there that in the UK, when we look at, um, at the, um, Russia Today in the UK, Breitbart, etc., we found a very uh, strong pro-Trump uh, community, very also strong UKIP activist. That was not a surprise for us. Pro-Russian activist here. But what was very interesting, it was this community. And inside this, you have two things. You have um, Labour members uh, advocating for peace in Syria and supporting Russian actions in Syria, but you have people from the left. And here, 
you have Scottish activists asking for a new referendum on Scottish independence. And you say, why are they in the Kremlin network? Because one of the narratives of the Scottish uh, activist is to say, BBC is misinforming about what's happening in the UK, what's happening in Scotland. So Russia doesn't need to go into the far-right narrative every time. They just try to adapt, say, okay, you want to see BBC misinformation? I can feed you with stories with BBC misinformation. That was, Alina was changed just before. They just feed the right people the right narrative just to be sure everyone is being cautiously but slowly slipped away from the mainstream medias to look for other alternative sources of information. And tomorrow, we are launching our monitoring project in Italy. And that is the first map we've produced. Um, and what is very interesting about Italy is that we have also far-right activists. We have the Five Star Movement, which is a populist movement in Italy. We have our still pro-Russian activists. We found it. We find them everywhere. But what is interesting, and I think that's going to be one of the main debates on the Italian elections, a strong anti-Euro activist, both, both from the left and from the right, because you have a strong story of um, communist party in Italy in the, in the 60s, 70s, and you still have a strong network of people using being from the far left, and they are still anti-Euro and very active on this. So basically... We see that the, 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 the misinformation process is, is taking different paths. And when we think about what can we do, my question is more is, why are we waiting to do something? There are something going on. It's not going to be Macron leaks the next time. It's going to be, to be more tricky than this because everybody learned from their own mistake. So we, we, I think we all need to work together and to be sure that private companies, NGOs, uh, governments, we all in the Western world trying to join our forces to do something about this. Uh, <laughs> May I ask you, uh, I mean, this information seems to be right now in, the, in a kind of radical technological development where it's teamed up with cyber crime, as you used, and artificial intelligence, machine-driven communication, etc. Can we really, are we ahead of the game uh, on the other side? I mean, clearly you are, but, but in a general societal uh, view, uh, we, what should we do otherwise? We're not ahead of the game. We, uh. we, we consider that we're already late. Huh? Mm. We're already late on the game. This is, the, this is yesterday's game. Today's game, we, we don't have any clue about what's going on. So I'm, I'm not a big um, partisan of machine automation, uh, botnets, etc. I, I think it's overrated, but... Um, that's my personal point of view. I think, I think on the contrary, like human being paid to do political uh, work online, it's been done on the offline world before. It's going to be done in the online world after. Uh, it's it's simply using the tools you you have. Nothing is new in this. It's all politics and all communication. When you before when you wanted to have your message spread, you take the good person and you put it on TV and you say, you, you're giving the, the right speech to, to say. That's, that's, nothing is new, it's just like, we have new tools, and we, we think new tools are going to bring new ways. No, new tools are going to bring the same ways. The problem here, when we look about people saying, people are going into uh, new uh, new media, and they, they don't talk to each other. What a surprise, what a surprise. <laughs> Filter bubbles have been in, in, in social communication for the past 40 years. As, as a theoretical, as a theory of, uh, of communications. It's, it's just the same. We just need to, to um, take, our, take our old books, reopen them, and just like add social media in this and say, okay, how does it work on this? The, the, the danger is it's fast, it's massive, and there are new challenges ahead, but the recipe is the same. Thank you very much. Uh, Nils, you have a long experience of public safety and security. You're the director of MSB, an agency that has an important, and I'd say, growing responsibility uh, in the field of societal security and, and also total defense. Uh, we just heard from the French case. Uh, how is Sweden affected in this new disinformation landscape? And what should we think about when we're closing up to our own election next year? Please. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to express my gratitude to the Swedish Institute uh, and to the Atlantic Council for arranging this panel and uh, on a topic that is of great importance for Sweden and for my agency, as you addressed. Uh, MSB is an 
all hazard agency with a broad mandate. Uh, we cope with everything from everyday accidents to natural disaster, pandemics, cyber incidents and consequences of terrorist attacks. Uh, since 2015, we also have a role in preparing society for warlike scenarios as a part of the resumed total defense planning. Our responsibility includes the development of a modern psychological defense. The concept of psychological defense was launched during the Cold War in the early 1950s uh, and now needs to kind of updating as societies and the media landscape, as we heard, are quite different today. Uh, uh, an important component in the modern psychological fence is the ability to identify and counter disinformation and information influence campaigns. In 2014, a country in Europe invaded another country and lied about it. Since then, we have learned a lot uh, and we have also experienced a dramatic increase in the demand of our expertise as the agency. Both in national perspective and as a part of our international cooperation with partners across Europe Atlantic region. Uh, what we have seen over the past years is in effect worrying development. Sweden and several other countries are being targeted on a daily basis by information influence campaign directed from Russia. Uh, the ultimate pur purpose of the, this campaign, as we see it, is to divide the population and reduce public trust uh, in our democratic processes. Russian media and other actors do not worry that much about the accuracy, uh, uh, accuracy uh, of, of the information. They achieve their goal just by creating uncertainty about the facts. In fact, Russian media, media rarely use outright lies. They use what is often called factoids, uh, a mix between rumors, uh, lies, and some element of truth, often with the aim to confuse the audience. Uh, Russian uses, as we heard, both overt and covert means uh, to achieve its end. They target both uh, the extreme left and the extreme right of the political spectrum uh, to get their message across. And we know that Russian star state media, Sputnik, uh, say uh, Russia Today, are in close cooperation with some Swedish extreme right media. The challenge for us uh, in our effort is to identify and counter Russian disinformation is that Russian media and the trolls operate fast. It used to take uh, between five uh, or seven days before a piece of news on the Swedish was transformed into target disinformation. Today, this can happen after a few hours. The pace of, of uh, identifying and countering such activities is much more demanding today than just a couple of, days, a couple of years ago. Building resilience against these activities consists of several elements. At the base, we have the resilience of the population our will to endure hardship and to fight, even if the outcome might be uncertain. We also have to safeguard the democratic institutions, the need to uphold a free and independent media. And media must be able to continue to function also under very severe conditions and in an armed attack. This includes the need for cybersecurity, and a robust and redundant technical infrastructure with secure communication links. In time of crisis, the public appetite of information increased drastically. We can expect an adversary uh, to use emergency situation to manipulate and sway public opinion. Our crisis communication capability is essential to ensure that government messages are coordinated validated and that they can reach out to intend audience. At the sharp end of the stick, we must also have capability to identify and counter information influence campaigns, both from state actors and from terrorist actors. Uh, at the core uh, of the renewed capability, we have a team of analysts that are trained uh, for this task. 
My agency also works in close cooperation, uh, collaboration with other government agencies in Sweden, such as the Swedish uh, Security Police and the Swedish Institute and the National <coughs> Elect... <coughs> Sorry. We take that. My agency also works in close col collaboration with other government agencies, such as the Swedish Security Police, uh, the Swedish Institute and the National Election Authority, among several. An example of actions taken by MSB is we continually monitor and analyze foreign efforts in disinformation. The monitoring service includes messaging about Sweden and the Swedish interests, analysis of narratives and themes, uh, analysis of when and where the information was detected, and also Analyze, analysis uh, of the purpose of the message. message. Uh, we have uh, created a training program for public servant uh, and key stakeholders at national, regional and local level. The goal is to provide them with the tools better understand and counter the threat from information influence campaigns. In this effort, we also cooperate with the Swedish security police. And so far, we have almost... Uh, 11,000 person uh, being trained. MSB has also been tasked by the government to support media companies in the preparedness planning. Since uh, I uh, last met you in Washington, we have had a high level meeting with some of the key media com companies to discuss ways and means of identifying and countering disinformation. MSB has also seconded subject matters experts to, to NATO Strat uh, Stratcom Center of Excellence in Riga and the EU Stratcom East Task Force in Brussels. In light of the experience from recent elections in the uh, uh, several countries, MSB and other government agencies have uh, initiated a program to protect the upcoming Swedish parliament election in September this year and uh, next year. A nationwide information effort uh, is uh, now underway uh, to train uh, all election officials at the Swedish county boards and the municipalities on how information influence threats against the election can be uh, counted. The Swedish Security Service has also been tasked to support the joint efforts in the protecting uh, the, collection, uh, the uh, election. They will educate all political parties on the threat from information influence campaigns, including the threat from cyber operations. A handbook on methodologies to counter information influence campaign is being written by academic experts. The handbook will identify and analyze current international research in this area. Uh, the audience for the handbook will range from general public to uh, practitioners, and I hope it will be ready to July next year. I'm looking at my so, feel no pressure. Uh, the government has tasked MSB to launch a public information campaign on how to behave in emergency and war. This campaign will be rolled out during the spring uh, uh, next year. My agency will also initiate a research program for coming four years on information influence activities, both from state actors, but also from terrorist organizations. And finally, for us at MSB, it's a great importance to have the international partners to succeed in our mission. The seminar is an ex excellent example of how we can work together to, to bring this topic up. And I'm very pleased that MSB is on the program today and in the closed seminar tomorrow, and that we are able to contribute to this transatlantic study project to make this report a good report. I stop there. Thank you for the floor. <laughs> May I ask, uh, I mean, we've had several incidents the last years uh, with the forged documents, for example, relating to, to Ukraine and to Brexit, but we've also had several fake stories on more internal Swedish issues, such as immigration. And I wonder, with the upcoming election and the fact that it looks very difficult for any, any of the kind of traditional blocs to form a stable majority, I mean, it's pretty likely that we'll become a form some kind of unstable majority. Does this make us more kind of attractive in the eyes of, of someone who would like to 
disinform and affect uh, the politics in Sweden? Of course, it, we, we, we will be more vulnerable if, if we don't have a strong government. <laughs> it's, it's come by saying. Uh, of course, it's so. So, so sitting, uh, sitting on the east side in, in Russia, looking at, at this, uh, I think they are pretty amused. I would like to, to ask a question actually to all of you before we also have a few questions from the audience, I'm sure. But, but we've discussed several of the causes of, of why this is so big now, disinformation. We have the kind of adversarial ambitions of certain actors, but we have political polarization in our own, in our own societies, technological developments, and also changes in traditional media and the kind of knowledge industry that we represent here today. Um, and you've, several of you have indicated that the response and the resilience that we need need to be provided by, by several actors, civil society, private industry, uh, governments, of course, academia, journalism, etc. How do we coordinate this kind of everything that needs to happen while still staying true and being kind of open liberal societies? Sounds like a difficult task. Anyone want to <laughs> give an easy answer? Um, I think... The U.S., Europe, meaning the EU, need to bring together the key stakeholders. So we start working together. The key stakeholders are civil society groups, um, social media platforms who may want to rehabilitate themselves. You know, we, we should look for converts rather than focusing on heretics, right? Let them come in. Um, and I think working in the government all those years, I am a believer in establishing institutions, but informal may work better in this case. Bring together, we need to create a forum for dialogue because as Alexander said, you know, any list of recommendations is going to be, that we come up with is going to be out of date by the time it's, you know, by the time we hit the send button. Right, which means we need the habits of dialogue, and that will actually help us in the task of resilience. Um, so that that's where we're headed, and we're going to even the current American administration has fallen off its more extreme anti-European unilateralist attitudes, and is finding its way to something more collaborative and putting politics aside it's certainly my intention to help the more constructive forces within the the Trump administration find a way to deal with the problem okay so bring together the stakeholders collaboration keep it transatlantic just to follow up on that very quickly um, I don't think we need to coordinate, frankly, in some ways. Uh, I think having these dialogues, like the one we're having here, like the one we had in D.C. back in September, um, is the key. But there's never going to be a democratic response that comes from the top. And there shouldn't be. Um, the, the response to authoritarian regimes meddling, interfering in our democratic process has to come from the bottom, bottom up. It has to be a democratic response. So what does that mean? It means that all of these stakeholders have a discrete but important role to play. And I think what we don't know right now still um, is what are the gaps and who should fill those gaps? So there's a role for policy, there's a role for uh, civil society, there's a role for private sector firms, uh, but we need to talk to each other more to understand who does what. Um, and I think that is going to have to be the key going to have to be the key, and it's not going to be coordinated. I live in Brussels. <laughs> My biggest fear is that uh, we'll have a Horizon 2045 plan on fighting fake news, <laughs> which will be beautifully designed, but completely useless, and that we work 15 years to have a consensus about what is fake, what is truth, should we apply this to this and this and this and how we should legislate? Okay, we can talk about this. We can have philosophical discussion. I'm, I'm open to any kind of philosophical discussion. But at some point we have a problem. If by 20, 2045 we don't have any democracies anymore in, in the Western world, problem is solved, huh? Um, no, I, I think 
many people are doing, many people, many organizations, individuals also, uh, NGOs, private sectors, many people want to work on this. Many people are genuinely trying to engage with this and trying to drive change. What I'm afraid of that um, from my structure, from my organization, we don't have time to apply for money for European projects because that needs to have one, one person working full-time on drafting a financial draft for, 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 for weeks and weeks. I've done this uh, in last month. I know, I know how it is. So we don't, we don't have time for this. So if we don't have time for this, we don't have time to work on, on other things. So I think what civil society is, is to support, um, informal support, uh, help, uh, Funding from foundations, funding from people who want to actually work on this. Uh, we don't, uh, we're don't. great thinker, but we are uh, better on, at, at doing things. Uh, I think um, as Fred uh, uh, said in, in his initial speech, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's about our values. We protect our values, so that's that's a very very important point. We are democratic, free, liberal countries, and and that's what we protect. Uh, that's the first. And as you heard in my speech, uh, awareness. What what is this going on? What's what's happening? Can we can we educate to another level? Uh, but I totally agree with with uh, Alexandra that that we 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 can't we 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 can't coordinate everything and we shouldn't try to coordinate everything uh, and so go back to what are our values uh, and educate high awareness Um, thank you very much. Really interesting stuff. Um, Ambassador Fried, you mentioned gathering stakeholders to coordinate. One can, the one stakeholder that you didn't mention that I think is important is uh, the media, that is the mainstream media. And I guess my, this is sort of the, I represent uh, the local. We produce news in English from Sweden and other countries. So we are in this space. Um, and I feel on the one hand that the media, is critical to sort of turning the tide, part of the, the combating this. But where where do you see where people used to get their media, their information? They used to be able to trust it. Uh, managing this new landscape, what what should we be doing? The stakeholders certainly include media. Um, I don't like the phrase mainstream media because that's been distorted as a, a pejorative in the current weird Washington political context, but certainly the stakeholders include media. And it's not so much coordination, but the sharing of ideas. Some things, some of the defense against disinformation will involve policy, compatible policies. Some will involve common approaches uh, to social media companies. Um, ultimately, the strongest foundation is values and bottom-up civil society learning tools of self-defense. But dialogue can help. Um, specifically, I think that media, that ordinary media needs to be sensitive to um, the contemporary tools of manipulation. So don't refer to RT as if it's a legitimate news organization. It's a propaganda outlet. Okay, in the Cold War, we didn't treat Pravda as a newspaper. We treated it as an organ of Soviet information, Soviet government information. And I think that sort of um, media and social norms is important. All right, I mean, that's, and and then, also to identify, um, to learn how to be, to learn how to identify uh, Russian trolls um, masquerading as citizens of our countries uh, is also important. And that's going to be, that cannot be top-down directed. 
it's got to it's got to develop um, through a process of dialogue and social awareness. Uh, uh, on on the media question, as I addressed in, in the speech, we're trying to have a, a dialogue, uh, but it, it's going back to our values. We want a free press, so so uh, we kind of start to dance slowly together uh, and and hope to find uh, uh, ways to, to uh, have a fruitful dialogue. Uh, we invited them the last time and I think we will be invited the next time so they will be the one who has has set the agenda. Uh, and another thing, uh, what we are doing when we are seeing these campaigns coming up is to actually inform and we do inform them, uh, the, the ones who are attacked, uh, giving them, this is what we see, do what uh, you have to do, what you do with it. And it, it could be to, to agency, but it could also be to, to media. So as this is what we see. Here, here you have the information. Uh, two small stories, a French one. Um, three months ago, there was a split in the Front National, in the far-right party, between uh, two tendencies. One of these tendencies is more sovereignist, less, let's say, racist. And they had a dinner at um, a French restaurant and they had couscous. Three or four far-right activists brought this and say, ah, oh, you see this guy, they left the Front National and they're now they're eating couscous. You know, they're not French, huh? couscous, not French. Four tweets. What happened? BuzzFeed article. What you need to know about the Couscous Gate? The day after, one million tweets. So there is also a responsibility of the media to understand what's going on online. And it's not because you see something online that it's a story. Second story, less funny. 18 months ago in the summertime, um, pictures on the beach in Corsica about two women uh, wearing uh, burkinis and supposedly uh, being aggressed by Corsican people because they are wearing bur bur burkinis uh, in a public beach. In fact, at some point, that was two Front National activists that put the pictures first, that was caught by local media, then AFP takes the thing and it became a political debate for one month. So there are things, and the, the, the most tragic about this, when they, they, um, they asked one of the far-right guys that was behind the, the, the operation behind this, said, we're very happy. For the first time, the, the, the medias are taking our stories and we don't have nothing to do. They're just taking it. They're buying it. So mission accomplished. Did we have another question up there? Oh, I saw it. Here we have a question, please. Uh, my name is Kjell Lundqvist from the Schiller Institute. Uh, I will tell you a story. Uh, around June 2016, uh, a, a company called Fusion got hired by uh, uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. Before it was, they were hired by the Republican opponents to Donald Trump. Uh, this Fusion company that then gave uh, the mission to a company in uh, London called Orbis, which is run by British intelligence. Up to the election, they produced uh, uh, 16 memorandums uh, uh, attacking. I think we uh, need a question rather Donald soon because Trump. we don't have a lot of minutes yes, left. Yes. Please. Donald, Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, after the election, they produced a 17th memorandum about it. You probably have read about this uh, 17th time. It was produced by British intelligence. That is a very heavy involvement by the, from a former government uh, in US elections, basically this from the UK. 
after at the same time uh, it was sorry you need to wrap up because we only have a yeah, few minutes left I, and there's a question behind if you if you don't interrupt me it will go quicker uh, you had the so-called Russian hacks uh, on the, uh, the computer in the DNC, Democratic National Committee. Uh, but that didn't happen, and the NSA knows that because they were monitoring all traffic to that uh, computer system, and uh, uh, it was not possible to tank down it. And according to WikiLeaks, it was an internal leak that produced this. And you, so that's it here. And you that sit in, in this panel, you all know this. So my question is, are you totally incompetent or are you just lying? We never invite incompetent people. Uh, another question over there, please. And then we're over to the panel. So we hear a lot about, my name is Henrik, working for a company called Widespace. We're in the machine learning on advertising and we're in part of the thing tomorrow. So uh, one of the questions I have is we always hear about these different stories of how governments do this and, and everybody does that. But we're all culprits as human beings and we tend to look for whatever reinforces our self-image or uh, makes us feel good for the moment. So I think, and here's a question, uh, what do we see, what, what should we do about that? The fact that people want to read stories that may, may or may not be true just because they reinforce our sense of self. Thank you very much. May I also just add a, a quick question? Was, we've been talking a lot about Russia, but are we focusing? In, I mean, there are other and also other authoritarian states with possibly an agenda to influence. Look, for example, at China. Are we focusing too much on Russia? Are we not seeing a, another threat coming up, or are we already taking care of that? So you have a couple of questions to choose between. Uh, a few minutes each, about two. Uh, you choose an order. Um, well, thank you for the. For the question, Hendrik, um, on the social psychology question, I think is what you're pointing to. Um, you're absolutely right. We've been focusing a lot on the supply side of disinformation and not on the demand side, right? This question of there's a reason why things go viral. It's because humans <laughs> repost them, interact with this content, and most of the time they don't read any of it. Um, Facebook's click-through rate, so the, how much people actually click on the content that they interact with, is less than 1%, right? So that also puts in perspective how some of Facebook's uh, fixes, uh, which will inform people they click through, uh, where the story comes from, teaches them how to identify fake news, are actually quite useless because people will not spend 30 seconds in this information overload environment, trying to figure out if a story is true or false. There have been a lot of discussions of this um, and a few proposals, uh, but they're all untested. So one proposal, uh, of course, is labeling, um, you know, to say Facebook started doing some, some, some of this with third-party checkers. Um, you know, so you look at something, you try to share it, and then a message pops up saying, this is, you know, questionable, dubious content. Um, if you go one step further and you have a big red, um, you know, flashing sign that says fake news, fake news, um, one, Facebook will never do that. But two, there's actually no evidence that this kind of labeling, and um, our colleague Geisha Gonzalez talks about this all the time, that this kind of labeling actually works, right? Uh, so people like junk because it makes them feel good, right? Uh, people like hamburgers because it makes them feel good. Telling somebody a hamburger has 2,000 calories isn't going to prevent them from eating it, actually. This is what the studies show. So I think we have to delve much deeper into this question. I think to do that, we have to have conversations not just with each other, so the foreign policy, national security community, but with people who don't really engage in these issues, like psychiatrists, psychologists, social psychologists, who understand these processes. And we have started doing a bit of this um, when I was at the Atlantic Council, and I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, I could talk a bit more about this, but I won't. Um, I think just very briefly on your question, and then I'll stop on Russia. Um, I think the point I was trying to make, um, but I didn't do it explicitly in my remarks, is that this goes far beyond Russia. The Russians have clearly developed and um, built up this toolkit of political warfare against the West, but it's not that good, actually. It's actually quite simple, and it relies on the tools that we give them, and it relies on Western institutions. 
But clearly, this is already being used uh, by other authoritarian regimes. So what will, ha- what will happen when China decides it's going to flex its cyber arms, which are more sophisticated than the Russians, um, much more advanced, have far greater resources, and they start interfering in elections in South Korea, uh, in Japan, uh, anywhere else, really. It's very easy to do. So I think this is far, far beyond Russia. The Russians started it. I think the positive effect of the Russians screwing around our elections um, across the West has been now that we're paying attention. And now we're learning what the toolkit is as a society. And even though I think we're still far behind, like Alexander was saying, we're still playing yesterday's game. Um, you know, it's a start and it's better than where we were before all of this happened. Um, I just got an ID from your thing. Um, um, what, is, what is the main fuel of social media? Ego. Okay. The more likes you have, the more the happier you get. Maybe there is something to do with uh, the more the more good news you share, the more likes you get. I don't know. Maybe there is something to test on this. Try to do reverse psychology. Um, for other stakeholders, um, during the French campaign, we saw something about Emmanuel Macron being funded by Saudi Arabia. Um, it was basically using the Kremlin echo chamber, but when you look back at the first tweets, creating a fake a news website from Le Soir, which is a Belgian newspaper, you had accounts that were very close to the Iranian regime. So maybe uh, some people are also using the tools that uh, others developed to hide behind them. And it's uh, very easy because you can say Russia, 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 but sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than this. For other stakeholders, we've seen that uh, for economic reasons, uh, China has been playing this game with uh, uh, Club Med, for instance, in France uh, four years ago with uh, fake news stories, fake news articles, fake profiles about um, a public offer on Club Med. So the the playbook is really open and uh, it's not very complicated to read it and to play, on the, to play the games. Niels, any final thoughts? Um, my theme is the raise the awareness uh, all the time. Uh, and actually work with it. And when you uh, get new knowledge, get it out as as fast as possible. Make it transparent uh, as fast as possible. Um, With respect to the theory that the Clinton, Hillary Clinton's campaign was actually responsible for everything, um, the accusation that the Russians hacked the Democratic Party. Well, you know, I've heard lots of stories. Um, That's not any truer than any of the others. I'm familiar with the story. It's wrong. Which leads to the other, uh, another observation. There are some people, some percentage, let's say 15% of people who will believe, in our societies, who will believe anything. We're never going to be able to help, to help that. And we, it, our purpose is not to dep- to act as censors. Not consistent with our values, shouldn't go there. There's another percentage, let's say 10 or 15% of people who will who are sophisticated enough to resist propaganda and disinformation. Our purpose is not perfection. Our purpose is to help people in the middle. Give to give them the tools to make in to be informed consumers of information they receive so that they can discriminate between disinformation and real information. And that's all we can do. And we will be, we will, we will achieve something less than perfection. Perfection's not the objective. The objective is helping at the margins in ways consistent with our values. And the tool should be transparency rather than attempts at content control. That's what they do. That's not what we do. The tools, look, we focused on Russia because, frankly, that's where the most virulent regression is coming from, and that's where the political attention is. But the tools we develop, the principles, the habits of cooperation, will be applicable for use against all kinds of sources of disinformation, Chinese, anybody else, you know, name it. But 
we need to develop those in ways consistent with our values. And right, as Alexander said, none of this is actually new, right? No, it, it, it's like discussions in the late 1930s about disinformation and propaganda coming out of Moscow. It is actually quite similar, but the technologies are different. So we have to f remember, ah, this sounds like conservative values, but I'll, I'll take any values that work, right? We have to remember the wisdom that brought us success and then apply it to new circumstances. And so, look, thank you for all of this. This is a, a great session. Thank you and very much. Worthwhile. And Nils, you said we need new knowledge. Actually, the, the slogan of this institute was once all the world's knowledge in one place. We, there was a bit of an alternative fact, so we, we stopped using that uh, slogan, but it is still at least our mission today to, to grow our knowledge, to increase our knowledge. And I'm very thankful that you, Daniel, Alina, Alessandra, Nils, that you came here tonight and were so uh, considered in sharing your knowledge with us. So thank you very much and please join me in applause.